1928 in Lacombe, Alberta. What did your father do for a living? Worked in the railroad when he wasn't in the army. So your father was in the army? In the Second World War. Second World War. Did you have any brothers or sisters? Yeah, I had four sisters and three brothers. Two of them served in the Korean War with me. They were in the Navy. So there's uh, military experience in your family. Oh, yeah, yeah. Growing up in Alberta, do you remember your school system? Well, it was quite a bit different than it is now because, like at poppy time, we go to the schools and just looking around, talking to the kids. It's way different now than it was then. You know, then it was fewer grade student. That's just exactly what you were, and you were marshaled into a place, and they have a little more freedom than we do we did at that time. But uh, I think it's good. Uh, kids enjoy it mm -hmm. when we go. They're never short of questions. Mm -hmm. What was your education? <laughs> Almost nothing. I went to grade eight. Uh, that was in 1944, and of course there was no money, so I went to work. I went to work for the CPR. And I stayed there for a few years. From there I went to Canadian National and stayed there for nearly 20 years. And in uh, 1950 I joined the Army. So the end of the Second World War has ended. It had just ended, yeah. And I was with a telegraph outfit, and the guys were starting to come back from overseas, so things changed in a hurry. A lot of these fellows, you know, had worked there prior to the war. <coughs> Excuse me. And when they came back, it was quite a bit different. So everything changed. Had to. It was no good the way it was. What was it like? Well, they expected long hours from you, many days, as many days as they could pour in a week, and as little as they could possibly get away with for pay. So it wasn't good. There, uh, thereby, you know, they, they started with the unions, which for us, was, we were, I was just a kid, and it was, for us it was good uh, that the unions came in because they were not paying and didn't want to didn't have to. You couldn't quit. <laughs> you were there to stay. So, um, you know, otherwise it was, the guys that came back, they were just, you know, super guys. Uh, they were real good guys. Took no horse from nobody, which was fine with us. You know, we were just kids. Do you remember that? Oh, oh, oh yeah. Some of those guys were I don't know. <laughs> Great soldiers. So it's 1950 and you hear that there's trouble brewing in Korea. Mm. Yeah, it was all in all the papers and everything. And that the Canadian government was wanted to send soldiers. Yeah, they, they then, well in 1950 when I joined, of course the papers was, were full of the government looking for people that would join up. And I was working for Canadian National at the time in Hope, British Columbia. And they, of course, they went on strike. So they put a bunch of us on a bus and we had to go to Vancouver, stand the picket line. Well, sometime during the night, a fight broke out. And a good friend of mine, he says, well, he's, if I got a fight, I might as well join the army. So I said, I'll go with you. So we went to Jericho Beach. That was the end of railroading till I came back. So that was how you chose to join? Yep. Just <laughs> then I wondered after, well, maybe I'd have been better off on the picket line, but no, it was okay. It was all right. They treated us pretty good. Did you know at that point what you were getting yourself into? Oh, good grief, no, never. Oh, no. Uh, probably if we would have known, like then, I'm sure <laughs> we would have stayed away from Jericho Beach. <laughs> But uh, that's just the way it is, you know. And, and I'm certain that there was no patriotism there because we didn't, I didn't even know what the word meant. Never mind 
being patriotic. He just went for something to do. Maybe glory, who knows. What was the reaction of your parents when they heard you were going to go to the Korean War? Oh. Well, they never really knew till they got my grip from the railroad that I had joined up. I didn't tell anybody. And my mom wrote me a letter saying, you know, well, it was bad enough that I had a brother in the Navy by then. And she said it was bad enough when Dad joined, but she didn't, she couldn't see the sense in me joining. But then she had a change of mind later on, which was good. <laughs> probably feared for you. Well, I don't know if she feared as much as my dad, because when I left, my dad was, hair was just about the color of your dress. When I came back, it was about as white as that stencil board. Big changes. Oh yeah, well, I guess he knew what we were getting into. And what did you know that you were getting into? What did you know about it? Didn't know nothing. I, like for my dad, I didn't ask many questions because he would just tell you if I haven't got anything decent to say, don't say anything. That's what he used to say. So we just kept quiet, didn't say nothing. How do you prepare yourself for this? Can you take me through the, the training that you received? Well, like I said, we joined in Jericho Beach and when the strike was over, they put us on a train in fact, I think that same day, if I remember right, and we went to Petawawa. And that's when I found out the big bottles of beer that Ontario had, we didn't have them here. But anyway, that's where they fitted us. And uh, one morning, they put us on parade, and if you wanted to go to Valcarchi, you fell in with a, a different sergeant. If you wanted to go to the RCRs, you fell in with a different sergeant. If you wanted to come back out west to go with the Patricias, you fell in with another sergeant. And needless to say, if I'm going west, <laughs> you know, that was where I come from. So I fell in with Patricias and that I served the whole thing with Patricias. So it was your choice? Yes. Oh, yeah. And it was a good choice, really. So do you have your equipment at this point? Are you no, ready just go? clothing, just clothing. And we did, uh, they called it BRASIC in Calgary, and small arms, we did lots of small arms training. And all the advanced was done in a place called Fort Lewis, Washington. We were there for a while, and that's where we got live fire training there. Uh, that's where you learn to keep your head down or you would have got it shot off for sure, even in training. But it was good training. It was really good. And we, like I said before, we had excellent people. Just, just the best of all trades. They were there. And most of those were Second War vets. So, you know, they knew what the score was. They knew a lot more than we ever would learn. But they were good. So you felt prepared to go to war? Well, oh, you think you are, you think you are, until you hit the line. And you may have been scared once or twice before for who knows for what reason, you know. But when they start shooting at you, that's when you get scared. And like everybody else, I served my, my year there, and I don't think there was a day that I wasn't scared. In fact, I'm sure there wasn't. Can you tell me about that fear, that, that well, different sense of fear? I don't think you can describe it. <laughs> it's a real, real sense. So you're heading to Korea, Mr. Reedsma. How do you get there? Oh, uh, we went by boat from Seattle to Japan. And I think, you know, uh, I must be getting old because I think they took us, only four of us left Japan at that one particular time to go to the front. And I think they put us on a light aircraft and we landed at the Seoul airport and they put us on a jeep. And f that's when I found out what it was like to, oh God. Do you remember what you were 
remember about landing in Korea? It was dirty. It stunk. And there was... I, I, I wouldn't even venture to guess how much money was floating around the country. You know, it was no good. It, wasn't, it, w it had no value whatsoever. You, you would have needed a wheelbarrow or a very, very large suitcase to pick it up. But it wouldn't buy anything. So we were supplied with scrip. Uh, when we had a payroll, or a payday rather, you stood in line, you got a scrip note. And most of it was 10 and $5. And they were only little pieces of paper. But that's the only money that was accepted over there was scrip. I had brought some home with me, but after I got back, I had a family, and you know, show and tell mm -hmm. raises the dickens with it. What was the morale like at this time? Well, I think it was good. At least you know where I was, it was excellent. Uh, they fed you, and uh, well, you were always on the move. It, it, it seemed like you never, you'd, you'd get a hole dug, so you'd get your head down, and then you were on the move again. So, but I thought the morale was pretty good. I think the people that, that really took a beating, you know, we were well looked after. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. Winter was tough, but it was tougher on the kids, small children, than it was on us. It, those the little kids, they just, they followed you everywhere because they knew they were going to get a pair of socks or something to put over their hands or, you know, uh, anything to wear, something to eat. And, and for them, I guess it was okay. For us, it wasn't all that good, but you got to learn how to eat beans. <coughs> Excuse me. You were a kid yourself. Here well, kids. we were kids, yeah, but these were little kids, you know, seven, eight years old. Anything that, any, well, anything, that's a terrible way to put it, but if a kid was 14 or 15, you just made doggone sure that he was ahead of you all the time. And your machine gun never came off of, on safety. It was off, ready to go at any time. Mm -hmm. And I was a machine gunner all the time I was there, so you... Everybody wore white. You didn't know who you were talking to, because white was their mourn. Their like we used black in our ha in our country here. They used white, and everybody was dressed in white, even little kids. But the teenagers were the ones you had to fear. So it's it, you're seeing it as dirty, a dirty country, and everyone's wearing white. Oh, yeah, it was a the country itself was. Pitiful. I, I, I don't know how they survived there. They have, well, to save their gardens, they grew vegetables on the roofs of their house. And if you disturbed that, you were in big doo doo. You just didn't touch that. You walked by it, had a look, but you didn't dare touch it. And anything on the ground that grew, well, it either got tromped on, ran over by tanks or jeeps or whatever happened to be in the road. And I think the Chinese themselves, they went through that country three times, and they didn't leave very much. They didn't leave nothing, but of course. What was the food like? Well, their food, yeah, I couldn't eat it. Uh, <laughs> I tried a few times, but no, I couldn't eat their food. It, they had stuff like vegetable marrow and melon, and it all grew up on the roof, you know, and they thought it was good, but our food, well, once in a while we got hot, or what they said, hot. It was supposed to be hot, I guess, when it left, but funny you should ask that because some some of the staff came up one time. I think it was, well, I don't even remember, but I know we were going to get hot rations. And a buddy of mine, he had no tin plates. You know, we had tin, tin, uh, best tins, and one would fit in the other. And then you had a cup with that. Well, he had lost his, so I, of course a hero like me and what I gave him <laughs> the larger of the two. And then you go down the line, and get your groceries or whatever you want to call it. And I come to the end, and the guy says, "Well, wh what are you going to have? You going to have tea, or are you going to have peaches?" And I said, "I got no room in here for nothing." So he dumped the whole works. 
It was just like eating out of a slop pail. Stunk about the same. And you were given your big... Hey, you ate it. Hey, you darn right you ate it. it. It didn't taste good, but hey, it was warm. If you had to eat out of a tin in the wintertime, you put a dent in the tin with your rifle butt or whatever you had. <coughs> threw it on the fire, and when the dent came out, you knew it was safe enough to eat. And you get it before it exploded, of course. But uh, the summer, that, that kind of food, a little bit of that goes a long way. You know, it, uh, once it's opened, you don't, you have your fill. Never touch that tin again, because it'll kill you. Bugs. Ugh. Hard to imagine for someone. Well, you, you had to have been there to really know what it was like. You know, you, you, you couldn't, you can't really tell anybody. I suppose these guys that went through the Second World War and in Europe have probably endured a whole lot worse than we did. But you just, you had to have been there to really know what it was like, you know, as a country. And th like thunderstorms I'd never seen in my life like that. Can you tell and me about the weather conditions? Oh, it, it could rain like you cannot believe. And uh, only once I seen, oh, thunder or lightning ball larger than the chair you're sitting in and just rolling down and over the hills, you know, and burned everything in its road. And it was going away from us, thank goodness. And it, I remember it hitting an old, Oh, I think it was a rice hut or something. I know we stayed in there once before that. Got lousy out of it, if nothing else. And that thing just disappeared. And it was raining like everything. And Can you dress for that? Well, you can't dress for that. You have a poncho. You know, everybody got a poncho. But when it rained like that, you, you couldn't wear the poncho because you had to throw it over your machine gun to keep the machine gun dry. So, it... it <laughs> You know, it's, it, Was it cold? Oh, it bitterly cold in the winter. Bitterly cold. Yeah. Branches got, oh, trees, you want to get the size of your fist from hoarfrost. Only thing good about it didn't last real long, but it was heck when you were in the standing in the trenches and you were at a stand to, it was terrible. Feet never warmed up. So it was cold. Oh yeah, it was very, very cold. That's why I say I don't know how some of these kids made it, you know. They weren't dressed. And our biggest problem was we had we had not the very best of footwear, but so it was. So you put up with what you've got and make the best of a poor thing. Mr. Reitzma, a young man from Canada is in a war, a strange country. Strange is right. And you're carrying a machine gun, and it's your responsibility for that piece of equipment. Yeah, it sure is. Can you describe a situation or let us realize what that was like? Well, I guess. When you were there, like everybody carried a 303, and that was a an excellent weapon, but it was slow, and you had to recock it each time you fired it. With a machine gun, I was with a like I carried a Bren all the time, and I think we had 27 rounds in that mag, and it was always a number two with you, so your f forward pouches were full of mags all the time, and you hung a grenade on the edge of it for backup. But I think that, that machine gun was probably the best piece of equipment they had over there. Powerful? It, well, yeah. It was a 303 round as well, but it, 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 it was a wicked machine, yeah. It was a good machine. So Noisy. Did you have to use it? Pardon me? You used that quite often? Oh, yeah. yeah. I should tell you that the one time I used it and it, 
uh, I just got sick. Uh, we were going, we were moving frontwards, forwards, if you will, and came across a hole in the ground. Well, it was in, into the hill. And the guy that was in charge there, he says, well, throw a grenade in there. You know, might be, maybe some, Charlie might be in there. And I said, well, I can't throw a grenade. I used them this morning. And I said, give me one of yours. And Oh, he said, I haven't got any either. So he says, put a burst in. The, the door was covered with a blanket, army blanket, wherever they got that, I don't know. So I put a short burst through the door, and all I could hear was kids screaming. Oh, so, you know, if we'd have put a grenade in there, you figured it out yourself, you know. To, and the kids came out, there was a, oh, eight or ten of them, and there were three nuns in there, and they couldn't speak English. They were, all they could speak was French. And one of the guys, we got a guy there, and he started talking to them, and they were hiding. Of all the places in the world to hide, you know, in a, but it was warm in there. And, was made so that shrapnel couldn't get them or anything, but if you'd have thrown a grenade in there, <laughs> somebody would have got hurt. That I uh, never left that. I, I can see them kids coming out of there yet, you know. So were they looking to you, a soldier, for protection? Oh, yeah. Then uh, all they do is look at your badge. You know, we had no hard hats. Uh, mine is in the Pacific somewhere where they told us to get rid of them. And they look at your hat, and of course they're not scared. But we did, we weren't with them very long until somebody came. I think it was some Provo guys came and picked them up, took them back to a place called Chorwan. I think that's where the orphanage was. Quite a ways away. So they were or orphan children. Yeah, they were all. They all came out of that orphanage. You know. So That's can you explain to me what it's like to be in combat in the mountains of Korea? There is no explanation for that. Is there a specific time that comes to mind about some action? Can you can you share that with us? Well, we that time I was telling you we were we had finished with these nuns and this these children, if you will. And, we're going up the hill, and there was some trees, I remember, and they were very few and far between because they'd get blown away, you know. They used them for hiding and stuff. <clears throat> and we came up this hill, and this friend of mine, he was from La Paw, Manitoba, and he says, oh, and he, of course he swore like a, like a sailor, you know, and he, he says, look at that guy. And I didn't. I hadn't even seen him, and he was sitting up against a tree. And he was Canadian, and I think he came from a place called Picto, Nova Scotia. And he'd been what we call it stitched. And they, the Chinese, they had a machine gun, and it, he was just stitched across here. And he was trying to fill these holes so that the blood and everything wouldn't come out with grass and dirt. And I looked at him, and this native kid looked at him, and he says, you okay? And then he started to swear. And he said, you never see a guy die before? And I said, nope. <laughs> yeah, but somebody had been there ahead of us. You know, he had, a, he had the, a blood cross on his head, so somebody had given him morphine. And <laughs> Did he survive? Oh, no. no he, he died before we got off that hill. That's where they picked him up at. So putting the mud in the wounds was trying to stop the bleeding? Yeah, and there wasn't as much blood from him, but there was a lot of plasma, white, clear stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. And it was coming right through his shirt. And he didn't have a jacket on, just a shirt. And his rifle was sitting on the ground upside down with a bayonet stuck in the ground. And I guess that's supposed to tell you that he's on the way out, I don't know, but... So he knew? He, he wasn't the only one we saw, but I remember him better than anybody else. Cause when he said, didn't you ever see anybody die before? And no, oh, I didn't. <laughs> but after that, we seen lots of people, lots of guys get it, you know, because Charlie used to come over the hill and he would banzai and 
some would have weapons and bugles, whistles, sticks, <laughs> and scream and holler, run right over the top of you, and then come back, hollering all the time. And mostly, if it was going to be a full moon, you just knew Charlie was on the way in, you know, you just, uh, you just knew that. When you use the term Charlie, can you, well, can you he, explain that? Well, that was the Chinaman. It was better to call him a Chinese, and most guys called him gooks. Mm -hmm. And of course, you weren't supposed to call him gook, but they just that's the way it was. And so you'd say Charlie's coming. Well, that was good enough. Up. That was good enough, you know. And they had so many people. I don't think death bothered them a bit, you know. It just, I'm sure it didn't. How does someone accept that? You're out there seeing death all around you. How do you deal with that? You don't. It makes you crazy. Anything else you'd like to recall about the battles? Any happy memories? Oh, yeah, lots of them. Oh, yeah, lots of them. We were, uh, when I went home, that was kind of a funny incident. We were at a uh, place called, anyway, where the peace talks were, Panmon Jum. And they were way down in the valley, the, the buildings were, and we were on top of the hill there. And at night you could see the lights, and in the daytime, of course, the balloons. And we used to watch these guys with field glasses. And Americans had come in one side, at one end of the, the hut, and. Chinese had come in on the other end. Sometimes they stayed five minutes, sometimes it really stayed a long time, ten minutes. And, but at night, Charlie came up the hill and gave us a bad time. And, and one night we just got the Dickens pounded out of us from him. Uh, next morning, the Marines came in. And I was starting to get come out with these other guys. And I had the Bren gun, and he says, well, where's your hole? This Marine sergeant said, where were you? And I said, well, just just over there. He's in a hole there. And I said, oh, yeah, there's a dent in the ground. <laughs> It'll get you, keep your head down. And oh, he says, can't bring people in there. And I said, well, you got a choice. You go in there or you die. Well, when they got settled, I can understand why they had worse casualties than we did, because they had three men, maybe four, for each one of ours. And, you know, you can't miss. So we got straightened around and talking to them and came over, the, went over the back, around the back of the hill, and there was a truck sitting there with a bunch of people on it. And this guy, the sergeant, came up to me and he says, we're looking for Reitzman. And I says, well, look no more. Well, he says, get your, you know what, on that truck, you're going home. And take me along to get there. Yeah. That was a nice word. Yeah, yeah even if he did swear, but. Yeah. I wonder why that was. Um, you got to ask too. Why did they never hit you? Yeah. You know, when bullets and sometimes they get pretty haywire. They get real haywire sometimes. You use the term. Are tapered. 